Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Riffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. We are back from the archaeological dig. In the previous episode, I have tucked away all of our different finds and my tools are looking a bit the worse for wear. But that's okay because our project for today does not involve a lot of digging. Instead, we are going to create a hostile mob farm. For that, I'm going to grab myself a bunch of wood for building material. We need to make some soul campfires, which is something we haven't touched on yet in the series. So there are two types of campfires in the game. The regular campfires, which you can make just using coal, and soul campfires, which use a soul sand block in place of the coal. These are functionally the same block, they burn with a different color flame, and they can both be extinguished using shovels, relit using flint and steel, you can extinguish them with a water bucket as well. The main difference is something I will need to take off my armor to demonstrate. If we stand on a campfire, we take a little bit of damage from standing on that, but not a huge amount. Whereas if we stand on a soul campfire, you take a great deal more damage. You actually take double the amount of damage from a soul campfire as you do from a regular campfire. I think the saturation was naturally healing me up as I was standing on this one. There you go. Half a heart of damage every time you hear that damage noise from a regular campfire, and a full heart of damage from a soul campfire. That makes the soul campfire incredibly useful for mob farms, because mobs will take a heart of damage every time they stand on a soul campfire as well, and that's usually enough damage to finish off the mob pretty quickly and allow the game to spawn more. And that's a mechanic we're going to be taking full advantage of as we make a mob farm. So we're going to get nine soul campfires. We also need to craft six or seven dispensers and observers. We will also need to craft seven or eight dispensers or observers. So I'm going to grab the observers from here. We'll go and get some bows from the skeleton farm and we'll use those to make the dispensers. So down here at the skeleton farm, I've been saving a bunch of the skeleton skeletons bows. You can make dispensers using half broken bows as well, but I've basically just been combining the bows into fully repaired ones for something to do while I'm down here waiting for more skeletons to spawn. So with eight dispensers, that should be enough. We're also going to take a trip over to the iron farm, which is probably overflowing at this point. We absolutely have more iron than the system knows what to do with at this point, and it's probably all just been ending up on top of this chest and then despawning, but wow, we've got a lot of iron in here. Well, we can expand the storage in here. I think we probably need to at some stage. Now, we'll need a bunch of buckets for this since we will need buckets of water to go in each of the dispensers, so I'll prepare eight buckets for that. We're also going to need a good handful of hoppers, so the iron from this is going to help us make a bunch of those, and I think that'll do to get us started. Now we're going to head out towards the ocean, and conveniently enough, there is a large ocean relatively close to our spawn point, and it's over the water of this ocean that we're going to build our mob farm. We're going to pick a spot out here that's a convenient distance offshore, I think probably around here. We'll pick a decent high piece of help, and we'll place a block on top of that. That's going to be the platform from which we'll start building our collection mechanism. Naturally, the collection area for all of the mob drops is going to be over here, and we'll need chests for gunpowder, string, rotten flesh, bones, and arrows. Those are the five drops we can expect to get from this, because it will mostly be killing spiders, creepers, skeletons, and zombies. So I've set up two double chests for each type of mob drop for now. We're going to connect those with hoppers later, but I'm going to save the hoppers I've got right now for something else. And the mob farm is going to be built above this, so if we want to expand the storage, we're going to have to expand it downwards from this point. But for the most part, most of what we'll want to collect from here is a couple of double chests worth of stuff that we can throw in shulkers, take back to our main storage system, and craft it into stuff from there. I'm going to build out this platform behind them a little bit here in preparation for building the storage filters. We'll just be using the same type of filters that we use for the storage over at my base. And the input hoppers for these chests are going to be here where this cobblestone is, which means that the row of input hoppers above that for the filters is going to be one row above that, and the row that's actually providing all of the items is going to be right there. And that's important because we need to make sure the output of the farm goes somewhere, because we're going to be building the farm before we finish off this storage system. So this hopper here is going to be what controls the flow of items to these chests. Now we're going to drop another hopper on top of that. We're going to place a temporary block right here on top of that hopper, and around that we're also going to place a ring of temporary blocks. Facing downwards into each of these blocks, we're going to place another hopper, and it looks like I will just need to go and get one more. You know what, at this point I'm just going to make a bunch of hoppers, because we'll need them eventually anyway, and I can always go back and get more wood. So we can place our last hopper of this 3x3 set of hoppers, and then we'll break out all of the temporary blocks from below, including this cobblestone one. That should leave one cobblestone in the chest 
there and the planks have just all fallen around. Now we're going to craft a boat with chest and we're going to place that directly on top of this hopper right here. We need to shift in order to place it and it might take a couple of tries. It might mean that you need to place it on top of the, the edge of this hopper. But we're going to get in this boat and we're actually going to carefully row it around so that we are basically directly underneath this central hopper. I can kind of align myself in third person, but it's a little bit difficult to see exactly where I am. Now if I get out, I should be able to get out onto this block, like so. We can remove the crafting table from there. And this chest boat is now positioned directly in the center of this pad of nine hoppers. And any items that end up in the hopper are actually going to be transferred through to the chest boat. It basically condenses down this pad of hoppers through one large storage area, which means that anything these pick up is going to end up stored in here until this hopper below has time to process it. This basically allows the chest boat to pull all of the items through from these hoppers so that any more items that end up on top of the hoppers take a little longer before they back up completely and more items that fall on top won't be allowed through. It's all still going to be bottlenecked by having this hopper below it, but the chest boat is kind of convenient for making this 3x3 area all go through a single input. Now on top of this 3x3 is where we're going to be placing our sole campfires, and this is the point at which we need to be very careful not to fall onto this because the sole campfires are going to kill us pretty quickly if we do. But campfires cannot set fire to wooden blocks, so we're okay to build the surround of this out of wood, and this is where we're going to start building the main body of the farm. This pit here with the campfires is going to need a wall that is at least three blocks tall, so we're going to build that up around the outside there. It's really two and a half blocks if you count the height of the campfires. But from each of these four walls, we're going to build out seven more blocks, so we end up with a stretch of planks that is eight blocks long, leading to the center where those campfires are. And we're going to connect the entire thing into one 19 by 19 square, centered on the three by three hole that we've created in the middle. This can all be made out of slabs if you want to save on material, but I'm not too worried about that right now. I farmed so much spruce wood in the last couple of weeks. Yep, I'm definitely going to need more wood, because once we've built this 19 by 19 platform, we're going to place a block on each of the corners, and we're also going to build barriers around the outside. Now on each of these corners, diagonally up from this corner block, we're going to place two more blocks there and there, and we're also going to place two temporary blocks either side of this corner block here and here. And those are really just a reminder to myself not to fill those two corner blocks with a water source, because we're going to dive down here, grab another bucket of water, and then back up here on the platform, we're going to fill each of these sides with a row of water sources. Once we've got a couple of those going, we can just take a water source from the middle of the two we just placed, so it's nice and easy to fill up one side. And as you can see, flowing in from this side, it reaches right to the edge of this hole where the campfires are, meaning that anything that's caught in this water stream is going to flow along and be swept into the middle. We're going to do the same on the other three sides as well, so that all four sides flow in towards the center. Then finally, we're going to remove these two cobblestone blocks, and we're going to place another water source above this corner block here, so that it flows downwards, creating a diagonal flow that reaches the corner of the campfire pit. And the reason we don't want to place water on these two corner blocks where I put the cobblestone is that that could end up creating water sources, which would completely flood this platform, and the water would no longer be flowing towards the middle. Because this tray of water is what's going to be catching the mobs that we spawn on platforms above this, and directing them into the center of the farm where they'll die on the soul campfires, and we can collect their drops. Hopefully you're following me so far. Far. The last thing we need to do to this tray right here is make sure that the blocks around the edges are not spawnable. And to do that, we're simply going to turn a bunch of the spruce planks into slabs and place slabs on top of every single solid block around the edge here. Okay, with that all taken care of, we are ready to build the platforms that are actually going to spawn these mobs. So we're going to scaffold up in the center so that we can build these centered on the campfires here. And don't worry, we'll remove the scaffolding a little bit later. So three blocks up from where all of this water is flowing, we're going to place our first dispenser. Now, just like the platform below, we're going to be building seven blocks out from the dispenser in each direction. Except this time, instead of making the platform perfectly square, we're going to be making it a diamond pattern. So we're going to zigzag from one point of this to the other, and then fill in all of the blocks in the middle. And the reason we build these platforms in a diamond shape like this is that when the dispenser is activated and dispenses water, the water will flow exactly to the very edge of this platform. And so once again, any mobs that end up spawning on this platform are going to be pushed off in every direction, and there is nowhere they can stand where there is a dry block where the water won't be pushing them. So having bucketed that water source and put it back in the dispenser, we're going to peel her up two blocks from this, and we're going to place 
another dispenser facing upwards. Then we're going to remove these two temporary blocks and we're going to place an observer facing upwards into that dispenser so the redstone output faces down towards the dispenser below. Then we're going to start our next platform attached to that dispenser and we're going to mirror the exact same diamond pattern. And with this setup, every time a dispenser on the layer above activates, the observer is going to detect that and send a redstone pulse to the dispenser below. Despite there being an air gap here, the property of quasi-connectivity that's present in Minecraft Java Edition makes it possible for this dispenser to activate because you're powering the air block above it. This is one of the things that makes this design of mob farm unfortunately ineffective on Bedrock Edition. Although on Bedrock Edition, mob spawning works very differently anyway, so I think ultimately you are better off looking up a design that is specific to Bedrock Edition. So with this platform done, we're going to start the next platform exactly the same way, and we're going to end up with six platforms stacked on top of one another. Okay, as expected, we now have six platforms all stacked on top of each other, and I'm on my final stack of fireworks, but that's kind of the point of building this farm, because we're going to be getting plenty of gunpowder from the creepers that will spawn in here. On this final layer, instead of a dispenser two blocks up, we're going to be placing a note block, and the note block is going to be activated to switch on all of the dispensers, flooding all six platforms of this farm. And you can set these platforms up to alternate, so that some are flooded when others aren't, but honestly, at this scale, it's not really going to make too much difference. But if you want to do that, you simply need to go in and on every other platform, you take the water bucket out of the dispenser, hold shift to place it above there and put an empty bucket in the dispenser. And then that platform will be flooded when the platform below is not. And you just alternate that down the series of platforms. Now with this note block above here, we can place an observer facing upwards into that. And <laughs> you should find that all of the platforms activate at once. There we go. All six of our platforms that look like they are flooded right there to the edge. We're going to punch the note block with a right click to switch off the platforms and once again we should be able to observe that all of the platforms are now dry. That's the state in which they can spawn mobs, switching on all of the dispensers will flush the platforms tipping all of the mobs off into the water tray where they'll go into the campfires and all of their drops will be collected by that little nest of hoppers. Of course, we do still have some scaffolding on each of those platforms that I need to remove, but that's just from where I've needed to get up to the next platform as we build out the farm. The last thing we're going to do is place another solid platform of blocks at the top here. And we're going to cover this with slabs eventually to make sure that no other mobs can spawn up here. But for the moment, we just need a place to work because we need a mechanism that will turn this farm on and off at regular intervals. Now we've got these platforms in place, I'm just going to come through and collect all of the scaffolding so that that's not in the way of any of the water streams. I've already punched out the scaffolding from the bottom here and with night falling, these platforms should start spawning mobs if we get further away because they'll be in complete darkness when the sun isn't shining. But we don't want the platforms to spawn mobs quite yet because we aren't quite ready to set up the mechanism. So I'm going to sleep one more time and we can make it daytime to do a bit more work on the redstone. So on top of this farm, we're going to build a very simple, very compact redstone timer called an Etho Hopper Clock, named after its inventor. We're going to place a solid block on top of the note block, have a comparator facing towards that, and two blocks away from that, we're going to have another comparator facing away into a similar solid block. In fact, I might make these stone blocks just so they stand out a little bit more, but the type of block is not all that important as long as they are solid. So on top of each of these, we're going to have a piece of redstone dust. We're going to have two hoppers facing into each other between these two comparators, which means we're going to have to place two of them like that, break one, and place it facing into the one next door so that items will basically be shuffled back and forth between these hoppers. If we put the items in there now, then they would just simply go back and forth every time the hopper was able to push them out. But in order to lock one hopper, we're going to be placing some sticky pistons either side of here and a redstone block attached to one of the sticky pistons. Then each time one of these hoppers gains content, it's going to activate the comparator, which will activate the sticky piston, pushing the redstone block over. That is going to lock the neighboring hopper, preventing it from pushing stuff out, but allowing items to be pushed in from the hopper opposite. And that will slowly fill up the items in this hopper and drain the items from that hopper. Once this hopper is full and this hopper is empty, the redstone block will shift over again 
and the same thing will happen on the opposite side. And each time that happens, this redstone dust activates for the duration that the comparator remains powered. And each time that redstone dust activates, that's going to power the note block below, and that's going to switch on the flushing mechanism for these platforms. So we're going to start by putting in, let's say, 10 items. And we're going to use sticks since they are nice and easy to obtain and we don't need to worry about losing any of them. We'll pop those in there. And as you can hear, all of the water platforms now flush. It will shift back over and the platforms will remain flooded. And then the next time the redstone block shifts back over that way, it's going to dry out all the platforms again, allowing more monsters to spawn. We can take a look at that from the outside as well. I'll try my best to preserve fireworks here. And we can see from a distance, there we go, all of the platforms slowly flood. And then once the redstone block shifts over again, the platforms all dry out once again. With night falling, we will actually be able to observe the farm working. The main thing we need to do is make sure that this top area here is completely spawn proof and that includes the solid blocks in the redstone mechanism because mobs can spawn on top of a redstone block. So nice and quickly while the sun is setting and the moon is rising I'm going to completely cover this top platform in bottom half slabs so that mobs will not be able to spawn up here and then we should be able to step away and observe this farm in action. Okay that's everything up here slabbed off that needs to be and now if I fly away towards the ocean here I can actually see a couple of zombies have spawned on the platform below but there we go once we fly away a little bit you can see that a bunch of creepers are spawning on that platform platform and when they get pushed off by the water streams they should all fall into the water tray that's where they will end up going towards the campfires and eventually dying and dropping all of that gunpowder now as we draw in towards the center of the farm and take care of any mobs that have spawned down here on the lower platform we should be able to look into this hopper and see that yes <laughs> aside from some of the building materials i dropped down here we have a bunch of mob drops piling up in here including 11 gunpowder. Now despite hearing those spiders you'll notice that we don't have any string yet and that's because spiders can climb walls so you might find that this farm is slightly less effective at dealing with spiders but that's okay we already have a string farm that's very effective if we need mass amounts of string. And while we do need to be fairly careful about how we place light sources down here to make sure that we don't light up any of the farm above us this tray of water should have adequate surface area to make sure that none of the light from the torches down here affects the spawning on those plants platforms because it has to be a completely dark environment in order for mobs to spawn and while these platforms are pretty dark right now because it's nighttime unfortunately the light from the sky above during the day will prevent them from spawning here and that's the next stage of this farm we're going to have to build a roof over this entire thing in order to ensure that the farm can operate even during the day. You'll also notice that it being nighttime and us being out here on the ocean, a bunch of mobs have spawned over there on land as well. There's some spiders and creepers lurking on the shore over there. And while we are a decent distance away, so they will occasionally despawn, the spawning of mobs is very dependent on the location of the player. And that's something we can discuss after we've finished building the roof on this farm. So now that I've slept and made it day again, the last thing we are going to do is build out a massive platform over the top of this using, once again, these bottom half slabs. And this area, the shade of the farm, is going to have to be 15 blocks out from the edge of this platform. Because, of course, the maximum light that this platform can receive is 15 from the light of the sky above. And we want to make sure that all of that light is blocked right up to the very edges of the farm. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is the central platform, and that is the reach <laughs> that we have to go out to. Fortunately, we are making this out of bottom half slabs, so we can save a little bit on materials compared to using full blocks. And for the sake of keeping the maths here convenient, we are going to be completely squaring off the shade of this farm. Although, if you want to save on materials, you can, of course, make the corners diagonals, sort of to match the diamond shape of the center of the farm. But effectively, the shade needs to be a 43 by 43 block platform of bottom half slabs at the top of the farm like this. So this is going to be quite the effort and require quite a lot of materials. But this is once again why I'm building this out of wood, because a single log of wood can be broken down into four planks. Three of those planks can be broken down into six slabs. So you're able to get a whole bunch of material out of mining a relatively small amount of blocks. Okay, oh boy, that's a lot of slabs. This almost looks like a creative world right now, but we have done it. I still have a ton of slabs in my inventory, and I've also brought along the ingredients for our item filters that are going to go down here, because once this thing is running, it will definitely be producing a lot of mob drops. It's probably produced a fair amount of them already. There's some string in there even, so the spiders are now dying in there, and we can start removing all of these temporary cobblestone blocks and putting in the item filter system. I probably want to expand 
the platform on this side at least one more block so we can put in another chest for overflow because there are occasionally mobs in here that do not fit into these five categories. Like chicken jockeys, for example. A baby zombie can spawn riding a chicken, and once those die on the campfire, that will leave some chicken and possibly some feathers that need to go somewhere, so we're going to be putting an extra chest on the end for those. Overflow chests are, in my opinion, just a crucial part of any storage system like this, because at some point or another, something is going to go wrong. But it sounds like some mobs are spawning in here already, which is very good news for me. And of course, we need to do what we've done with previous item filter circuits, where we set up a row of hoppers facing in towards these comparators. Redstone dust behind each of these comparators, a bunch of repeaters facing that way, and then we can connect the redstone dust to this last row back here. Crawling underneath using our elytra, we can place the redstone torches on the front of those blocks. That should lock these hoppers, and we can set each of these up as an item filter. Of course, it would help if we renamed these items just for the sake of filter security, but I'm not expecting any cobblestone to come through these item filters, so we can just set those up as they are. We'll make sure that there is one last chain of hoppers feeding into that overflow chest and then we can link this set of hoppers up to the one that's connected to our chest boat and now these filters should auto program themselves because bones will go into the first one whatever comes next string is going into the next one we should end up with rotten flesh gunpowder and arrows popping into each of these as well there we go there's the rotten flesh the gunpowder will start to come on through and the arrows should be last so as you could already hear just there the mobs had started dying in the farm and if we spend a little bit of time flying around this farm we should now be able to catch a couple of spawn cycles where a bunch of mobs are generating in there. There's a few creepers there, there's a few spiders, you can see the silhouettes of the mobs as they fall down into the catchment area where those campfires are, and if we get a little closer, you should be able to hear them dying. There we go, you can see a couple of them dying as they hit the bottom of the farm there. And if we check these hoppers just to make sure all of their drops are filtering in through the chest boat, that seems like they are going through perfectly fine. So we should now start to see some of these hoppers fill up with items until the filter allows them through into these chests. We don't have anything in the overflow chest yet, so our filters are working as intended. The shade overhead is definitely larger than it needs to be, but that's okay. As long as it completely limits any sunlight getting into the farm, then that's going to guarantee that the system works as intended. And now we really need to talk about the specifics of mob spawning in order to make sure that this farm can be as productive as possible. Because while I'm just standing here on the shore, you'll notice that these platforms aren't really spawning a great deal of mobs. We're certainly within the range where mobs could spawn on that platform, because after all, when we were standing up there on the platform, we saw some mobs spawning on this beach. So why isn't this farm spawning a bunch of stuff while I'm standing here? Well, as we stand here on the beach, the game is spawning a bunch of hostile mobs. There should be about 70 hostile mobs spawned in the game right this very second in a radius around me, but they are all being spawned in the layers below me, in caves, in dark spaces, in areas where you typically find mobs spawning as you explore the world naturally. And that is because the game tries to spawn hostile mobs in dark areas within a certain range of the player, and right now we are standing in a location where this farm is within range, but a bunch of other dark spaces are in range, so spawning stuff in this farm doesn't happen very often when there are so many other dark spaces to choose from. The idea behind these farms is that we limit the area where the game can spawn mobs by creating a dark area like this and positioning the player in an area where there are no more dark areas within range that the mobs will naturally spawn. So that's part of the reason why we have built this farm above an ocean biome, because that limits the amount of caves that are directly below the farm, and thus limits the amount of dark areas that are going to be spawning other mobs. While we're standing in the center of the farm like this, stuff is less likely to spawn because mobs don't spawn right next to the player when it is dark. They have to spawn a certain distance away. And so the best thing for us to do here is to position ourselves up in the sky so that the bottom of the farm is the lowest point at which hostile mobs could spawn in darkness. And to really make sure this is as optimal as possible, I'm gonna pillar up to here, which is where the height of those campfires is, and I'm gonna take the Y coordinate here, okay? We are at Y. 70. Ideally, we need to stand 127 blocks vertically above the center of those campfires, because that way we won't be 128 blocks away from all of these spawning spaces inside the farm, but we will be 
over 128 blocks away from any terrain in the area that causes these mobs to spawn. And that is another one of the reasons we have built this over the ocean, is because the ocean is flat. If we were surrounded by mountains and hills and tall cliffs and stuff like that, it would be very difficult to guarantee that no mobs spawned outside of the platforms that we have built in the farm. But if this block here, the one above the note block, is the center of the farm, then we can scaffold up next to that. Even from up here at Y159, we can see that there are no mobs spawning on the beach biomes around us. So that pretty much confirms that we are away from any spawnable spaces on land. However, it is possible for mobs to still spawn below us in the ocean because the drowned can spawn in dark areas under the ocean and we've made a pretty substantial dark area on this ocean by building the shade of this large. So I think we will want to go up an additional 30 or 40 blocks from here just to guarantee that we are standing as far as possible away from anything else that might spawn hostile mobs. But now if we fly down towards the farm we should see that there are a bunch of mobs spawned on the platforms. There we go, a lot more than we saw when we were standing on the beach. And there we go, that sound pretty much guarantees <laughs> we are getting a decent amount of mobs dying in the farm and we can also check the chests here and we will find that a bunch of mob drops have now made it through the filters and into the chests so this farm is producing a great deal. To really show you this farm in action though I'm going to grab the rest of the scaffolding and we're going to bring a camera account in to show you what's happening here in the world. Okay, I've added a bit more scaffolding, so we are now up at Y178 above the farm, and if I switch to my spectator account, which I've logged in via the local area network, we can actually go on down here and see the farm in operation, since spectators don't have anything to do with affecting mob spawning. And as you can see, oh, there are a couple of actually ended up on the edges of the farm, they're probably just swept out by the water streams and pathfinding on their own. But they might actually make their way in towards the center of the farm in a second anyway, or they'll just despawn. So as we can see from the glowing eyes of the spiders and the silhouettes of the other mobs in here, a lot of mobs are spawning, they're all falling into the water, and as they group together here in the center, they should harmlessly fall into the pit and take damage until they die. A couple of spiders are trying to climb the walls here and there, and that might occasionally make it difficult for mobs to fall into the 3x3 area, but we've made it wide enough and deep enough that it shouldn't be too difficult, and sooner or later, the spiders will just end up perishing as well. And each time these water platforms flush, they're delivering a bunch more mobs to the center. The mobs should die in time for a bunch more to spawn on the platforms above, and that's when the next cycle of the farm begins. So this is working pretty optimally at this point. You can dial in the timings a little bit by adding or removing items from the Etho Hopper Clock at the top there, but it seems like we're getting plenty of mobs with each cycle. So now all it will take for me to get hold of a bunch of gunpowder, string, bones, arrows and rotten flesh is simply to stand up here in this platform for a while. Go away, make a cup of tea, come back and we should have a decent amount of mob drops. If we leave it overnight, we should end up filling up all of those double chests down there with items that we can use for the remainder of our game. With the spectator account now quit out of the world, I'm going to fly on down here using my elytra so I didn't just like plummet from the top of the farm. And let's see what we've got in here. Yep, we're already onto our second stack of items in each of these chests. The gunpowder, the bones, the rotten flesh, all of that stuff has started to flow in at a convenient rate now. The chest boat there is still performing admirably as a storage buffer. I'm gonna grab all of this gunpowder and I'm gonna make some more fireworks because we are close to running out of this stack now. And while I'm crafting myself some more fireworks, I will explain a little bit more about the principles of mob spawning and why we built this farm the way we do. Welcome to a creative test mode flat world, which I have made with 64 layers of stone and then a single layer of smooth sandstone at the top, purely to help with visibility so that you can see where mobs are spawning when we fly up into the air. Around me with 128 block distance to each one, I have set up four pieces of red concrete so you can kind of tell the utmost distance at which mobs will spawn. And I've temporarily disabled mob spawning, given myself an infinite night vision effect and set the time of day to midnight permanently. So now when I re-enable the mob spawning effect by doing game rule do mob spawning true, you'll be able to see that all around us in a pretty wide radius, monsters are gonna be spawning. Basically all the way up to the perimeter that I've marked out using those red concrete blocks. And that is the normal radius in which monsters will spawn 
in a survival context. When you're walking around, there will probably be about this many mobs within a 128 block spherical radius of the player, so a 256 block diameter from end to end. But as I mentioned, that radius is spherical, and as we fly higher up in the world, you'll notice some of the mobs around the outside spawning and despawning in an attempt to stay within the radius of the player, to the point where once you get a certain height, you'll notice that that sphere tightens the radius in which those mobs can spawn. Let's take a look at how far up we are right now. We're at Y120, and so they're still fairly spread out, but they are not spread out with nearly the range that they are when you end up slightly closer to the ground. And if I go up a little higher, let's say if I actually teleport myself to the exact coordinates, let's do 1000, which we're at 1000 X and Y in the world, and I put myself at Y125. Now, the only place mobs can spawn is in this very tight radius below me, and it takes a little while, they kind of cycle through it, a few of them will path find out of the area, but you will find that eventually it stabilizes with a whole bunch of mobs condensed into a very small flat area. That is because this invisible sphere with its 128 block radius is barely touching the ground at that point in the center, and that's the only place in which mobs can spawn within 128 blocks of the player. If I get a couple of blocks higher, they simply disappear entirely. Then if I cancel flight mode and I fall back down to the ground, you'll notice they spawn in a much broader radius around me. And that isn't them just leaving the render distance or anything, that is literally all of those mobs around me me despawning. If I'm up here in the sky and I teleport myself directly to the ground, I should look around and see that mobs have not spawned within a circular radius of about 24 blocks from the player. They may wander in towards me like that creeper over there is doing, but they don't end up spawning within that radius of you. They'll spawn in a kind of circle around the outside. And anywhere further than 32 blocks away from the player is a radius in which they can both spawn and despawn. It's also the radius in which you won't find them pathfinding all that much. Take a look around here, none of these skeletons, zombies, or creepers are really walking around, and occasionally they'll blip in and out of existence. That random spawning and despawning that occurs between 32 and 128 blocks from the player might still happen to some of these mobs because we are standing 128 blocks away from the lowest point in the farm. So occasionally, once a mob spawns in the farm, they might blip out of existence before they have a chance to be swept off the platform. But mostly, we should find that they're all swept off the platform and that no mobs spawn in the surrounding area because we are so high up in the sky that the radius in which the mobs can spawn tightens to this very small area. And it is in that area that we have built multiple flat surfaces which are ideal for mob spawning. If I stay up here at Y125 for long enough, then when I come back down to Y0, we're going to find that a lot of those mobs have still stayed in position and that there are only a few that are around me to the outside. This is more or less a visual representation of the hostile mob cap, a behind the scenes number that is effectively the maximum amount of hostile creatures Minecraft can spawn. Typically, you'll find those spread out over caves and on the surface at night, so you won't find all of them spawning in one place like this unless you create conditions where there is only one place they can spawn, which is the whole point of this hostile mob farm, controlling the locations in which they can spawn so we can set up a situation where they can die easily, much like our skeleton spawner, but with a lot less manual input. And now we have this hostile mob farm set up, it's going to be the perfect way of getting a large amount of mob drops in a fairly short amount of time. A couple of hours spent standing at the top of this platform away from the computer, and we will end up with a whole bunch of resources in these chests. And the only reason there isn't a whole bunch of gunpowder is because I've already taken some of that and turned it into an entire shulker box of flight rockets for flying around with Elytra. With these, we are gonna be a lot more confident in traveling around the world, and the only thing we need to be aware of is my Elytra's durability. So from this point onwards, you'll probably find me flying around with Elytra a lot more, and I will rarely have a spot on my hotbar that does not have a stack of fireworks in it. Now, one last thing to recap before we wrap up today's episode is I've done a little bit more work on the storage for the iron farm. Because coming down here earlier in the video, it really felt like the farm was in need of a bit of a storage upgrade. It was quite clearly overflowing. And so now we have a bunch of filtered chests. The last three filters are simply for iron ingots. And we haven't quite yet got to the point where there is enough iron in here that it needs it. In the meantime, however, some of that iron has probably gotten backed up here in the hoppers because the other thing I've been doing is composting all of the poppies. The first item filter here has poppies in there and that's converting 
any flowers that the iron golems drop into bone meal for us. So we have an additional source of bone meal in case we need that for growing trees, farming crops, or anything else. And there were basically two double chests worth of poppies all in the storage for the iron farms. So I was fairly glad that we could set up an automatic composter, and that should soon chew through the last of these poppies and allow the iron to flow on through the system. But folks, that is where we're going to leave it for this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you've enjoyed this look at building a hostile mob farm and hopefully you folks will enjoy putting this to work in your own worlds. Make sure to leave a roof over your head like this so that you don't end up getting harassed by phantoms while you AFK here overnight. And you also might want to put a lightning rod somewhere around here just in case a lightning strike occurs. You don't want it setting fire to all of that wood down there. But thanks for watching. My name has been Pixelriffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.